I'm here to do the drug and alcohol awareness presentation that you guys have. Our new bus drivers, welcome. Thank you. So please stop this elderly man at 2 a.m. and ask him where he's going. He says he's on his way to a lecture about drinking, smoking, and staying out late. The officer asked him where he's, who's giving that lecture this time of night. The man says, that would be my wife. And then if you think this is bad, that you have to sit through this presentation, somebody is collecting urine samples all day, and you're not that person. So now that the jokes are aside, let's get down to the real presentation, the real reason that we're here. So drug and alcohol use doesn't just affect the user, and company drug and alcohol testing doesn't just affect the company. There's a, a lot of statistics here about drug and alcohol abuse. I'm not going to go through all of them before your eyes glaze over. I'm just going to pull out some key facts. 35% of employees have seen or heard of drug use on the job. 11% of employees have admitted to being offered to use drugs while on the job. Um, some, some more statistic, one that really sticks out on this slide, is that of the people who call the cocaine hotline, greater than 80% of them admitted to using or dealing cocaine while on the job. 26.4 million people would meet the diagnostic criteria for substance or alcohol abuse, meaning that if they went to a physician, they would meet the diagnostic criteria to be admitted as an inpatient in the hospital. So this is a little bit more than I'm using. This is you meet the criteria to be substance dependent requiring an admission to a hospital. 16.2 million were dependent on alcohol, 9.9 .9 million were dependent on illicit drugs, I'm sorry, 5.6 million were dependent on illicit drugs, and 4.6 million were dependent on both. So worker substance use and abuse, it's not necessarily limited to the off work hours. Uh, this is one of the things that we've seen. Of those 26.4 million people who were substance dependent, 16.10 million or 61% of them are employed full time. So they're not laying at home in the, in the bed using drugs. They're not laying in an alley somewhere. They're actually in the workplace. And in the line of work that you guys do, this is absolutely not acceptable. So now let me talk about the DOT required drug test because that's why you guys are drug tested because the DOT requires it. So when we talk about um, a drug and alcohol test, the DOT does say that you can have a second chance. However, because again, you guys are school bus drivers and held to a higher standard, Maryland has a zero tolerance policy for any school bus driver. It goes as far to say that any driver who has been a verified drug or alcohol test, confirmed positive alcohol test greater than 0.04, refusal to test, any of the things that would be treated the same as a positive, you will be decertified for a period of no less than 10 years. You cannot operate a school bus vehicle in any of the 23 counties or Baltimore City for a period of 10 years. So Maryland takes this very seriously and they go a step above what the US DOT says. Now, as of January 1st, 2018, the DOT changed the drug test panel. We still call it the nine to five, but they did add these four semi-synthetic opiates in response to the opioid epidemic that this country faces. So the four additional drugs that you're being tested for as of January 2018 are hydrocodone, most people know it as Vicodin, hydromorphone, most people know it as Dilaudid, oxycodone, most people know it as Percocet, and oxymorphone, most people know it as Opana. Now when you come in for a drug test, okay, um, you're going to come in, the person's going to give you the cup, you're going to go in the restroom, you come out, we're going to take the sample, we're going to split it into two vials. Both vials are going to be sealed up with a tamper evidence seal. You're going to match the numbers to the chain of custody and you're going to initial the bottles. The reason for that, when the bottles get to the lab, the first thing the lab does is open the bottles, take the A bottle out, the B bottle goes in the freezer. The A bottle is then screened for the presence of drugs. If it shows negative, none of the drugs are showing on this screening test, it's reported as negative to the medical review officer. 
If, however, anything shows up on the initial screening, then it's sent off for some type of confirmation test. The most popular is the GCMS, but there are several forms of confirmation testing. The cutoff levels that the drugs are tested at are established by HHS. Um, they routinely do studies to make sure that the levels that are being used are applicable. A good example would be uh, when they first started drug testing, the uh, opiate level was set at 300 for codeine and morphine, and if you ate poppy seed, you would test in at 300. The levels have been raised significantly so as to exclude poppy seeds as a logical reason for why someone tested positive. Uh, drug test results are reported from the laboratory directly to an MRO or medical review officer. The medical review officer interprets the results and reports the results to the employer. And then again, I talked about the split sample. The reason for the split sample is the lab, again, only opens up and tests the A bottle. Should the A bottle test positive for a substance, the B bottle, which is still sealed up with the tamper evidence seal in the freezer, is sent to a second certified laboratory to be retested. If the second lab doesn't found what the first lab found, the whole test is canceled. So in a urine drug screen, again, we still call it a nine to five, even though it's more drugs. Um, the five panel, the five are marijuana, cocaine, amphetamines, uh, opiates, and PCP. With the urine drug screen, testing can occur anytime somebody's performing safety sensitive duties, anytime they're on duty, but with federal motor carriers such as school bus drivers, you can test somebody even if they're off duty. You're allowed to test somebody anytime. Alcohol. Alcohol is a different story. Alcohol testing can only be done when the person is performing the duty. So immediately before, during, or after the performance of safety sensitive function. You can call somebody in on their day off for an alcohol test. It's completely legal for you to ride around cutting your grass, having a beer. You can't ride around cutting your grass, smoking grass. That's a different story. These are some of the detection times that we will find substances in the urine. Opiates stay in the urine two to four days, cocaine eight to 48 hours, amphetamines two to four days, PCP two to four days, marijuana two days to six weeks. Benzos one to three days, barbiturates two to 10 days. Those last two are not part of the DOT panel. However, they are part of the post-accident testing panel for non-DOT, which I'll talk about later, so I'm letting you know just in case, because those are two um, what we would call narcotics and also habit-forming substances. So who interprets the results? All DOT results and all non-negative non-DOT results are sent to the medical review officer before they are reported to the employer. So they go straight from the lab right to the MRO. So what, who is the MRO? Well, the MRO is a licensed physician. They have knowledge of substance abuse disorders and forensic toxicology. They know the whole procedure, everything that happens from the collection site to the lab all the way through. The DOT calls them the gatekeeper. They're impartial, they're independent, they don't work for the company, they don't work for Queen Anne's County, they don't work for the lab. Their job is to make sure that everybody followed the regulations, that everybody did what they were supposed to do, the testing process was done complete, the collection process was done correctly, and offer the donor an opportunity to provide a medically legitimate explanation for any metabolite that might show up. So what about prescription drugs? Well, that's a good question. The MRO, part of their interview process, is to contact the donor to see if there's a valid explanation for why we may have found a prescription drug or a medication. If you have a valid prescription, you provide it to the medical review officer, they verify it with the pharmacy, and they then will report it as negative. If you took someone else's medication, that is not gonna be a medically legitimate explanation. If you don't have a valid prescription in your name, that is not going to be a medically legitimate explanation. So any employee or applicant who does have an MRO verified drug test will be offered the opportunity to have the B bottle that I talked about sent to a second certified laboratory to be retested. If the second lab doesn't find what the first lab found, the test is canceled. Okay, the test is canceled. 
that doesn't change the first result until the second is not found. So if the second lab finds it, it is what it is. If the second lab in the period waiting for the second lab to reconfirm, the first result still stands. The only time the first result would be changed is if the second lab doesn't also find the presence of the same metabolite. So again, consequences of a positive test result, just to remind you guys, state of Maryland, 10 years decertified. No questions asked, no exceptions. 10 years decertified for a verified, MRI verified positive result where confirmed alcohol test greater than 0.04. So for employment testing. So before allowing a DOT covered employee to perform any safety sensitive functions, Queen Anne's County must have a negative result in their hand. They have to actually have the result. So you can't go to the, the collection site in the morning and then start driving in the afternoon. We have to have the actual result in our hands before you can get behind the wheel. So random testing. So all DOT covered employees, all school bus drivers are entered into the random pool. Uh, the random pool, we you know draw random drug and alcohol tests. The tests are done throughout the year. Um, it's unannounced, it's unpredictable, it can happen at any time during the school year. Again, alcohol testing may only be performed when you're actually driving. So if you ever get called in, which they don't have a habit of calling people in on their day off, but if you ever get called in for an alcohol test and it's your day off, you need to let the person at the collection site know, I'm not driving today, we cannot do an alcohol test on somebody that's not physically driving that day. DOT drug testing can be done at any time. So post-accident testing. So post-accident testing will be conducted by Queen Anne's County Public Schools anytime there's an accident. Now whether it's DOT or non-DOT, that decision is made based on the thresholds that the DOT puts forth. But if it doesn't meet the DOT thresholds, there is a post-accident drug and alcohol test conducted under Queen Anne's County policy. So this is done under Queen Anne's County Public School Policy, okay? And employees are subject to being placed on administrative leave pending the result of those tests. The good news is we have the instrumentation, the screening instrument that the lab has. We have that in the office. So we can screen the test in the office. If it's negative, it's negative, and it's reported right away to Queen Anne's County. If it's non-negative on the screening, it's bagged up and sent to the lab, just like a DOT test and you may be placed on administrative leave pending those results, okay? For a DOT drug test, in order to meet DOT, this is the DOT threshold, they say that if ever there's a fatality, we must perform a DOT urine drug screen. If any vehicle is towed from the scene and the Queen Anne's County Public School driver is issued a citation within 32 hours, so tow and ticket, we must do a DOT drug screen. If anyone receives medical attention away from the scene and the DOT driver, the Queen Anne's County driver gets a ticket, we must do a DOT drug screen. Alcohol is identical. It's the fatality, the ticket in tow, the medical treatment in tow. The only difference is eight hours. So there may be an instance where you have an accident at four o'clock in the afternoon and at the time somebody's towed but there's no ticket and the next morning the sheriffs have investigated and they've decided the Queen Anne's County driver is going to be issued a citation. They would need to have a DOT drug test at that point because it would be within the 32 hour window. They would have already not needed the alcohol because the eight hour window would have elapsed. They would have though had the DOT or the non-DOT drug and alcohol tests under Queen Anne's County policy because again, Queen Anne's County requires that after every accident, a test is done. So what would happen in that case is you may have gone over and had a non-DOT drug test under Queen Anne's County, a non-DOT alcohol test, and then the next morning they decided to give you a ticket, you would still need to go over and have that DOT drug test. Okay, Queen Anne's County also requires that you guys report every accident. You have to report every accident immediately. Do not wait to report the accident because if you don't report it, the parents are going to report it and that's not going to be good if they hear about it from the parents as opposed to you. 
Failure to result in a uh, failure to report an accident can result in you being terminated. It, it can result in disciplinary action. Failure to remain readily available for an accident can result in termination and decertification. Because as I said, there could be times where the accident happened and the sheriff's doing an investigation and the next morning decide to issue you a citation. Well, you need a DOT drug test at that point. If they can't get a hold of you, that's going to be a refusal to test on your part. So you need to make sure as a driver that you have a phone number that they can readily contact you and that you're readily available for that 32 hour period following the accident if there's any chance that you might get a ticket because if you don't get that drug test done, that is a refusal to test and that will result in you being decertified for 10 years, which would be rather unfortunate. So reasonable suspicion testing. This occurs when a supervisor has a belief that an employee is or has used drugs and, or alcohol and that's based on specific contemporaneous articulable observations concerning the behavior, speech, or body odors of the employee. I know that's a mouthful. So what does that mean? That means that it has to be something that they can see, they can put it in writing, it has to be a trained supervisor, it has to be going on now, it can't be something that they heard last week or somebody called in. It has to be going on right now and it has to be something that they can put in writing and they have to fill out a report. Now, that being said, again, I started this out by saying you guys are held at a higher standard. If the board, this is for a DOT, reasonable suspicion. If the board were to get a phone call from somebody and they were to say, this driver was driving erratically, or I know this driver is using drugs, they would have to send you for a non-DOT reasonable suspicion under Queen Anne's County policy, not because they think you're using drugs, but they need to do it because we always have to err on the side of safety and err on the side of caution. So because, again, you guys are held at a higher standard, if you might not have done anything, it could be somebody with sour grapes, you know, somebody was stuck behind the school bus late for work and they got your bus number called in and said you were driving erratically or like a nut, they have to send you for the test. It's nothing personal against you. They have to send you for the test because they cannot disregard a uh, notification that they got a possible behavior because let's just say they didn't act on it and it turned out you really were using drugs and then something god forbid happened there would be people coming out of the woodwork saying i called i told them about this person so don't take it as a personal affront if they send you for a reasonable suspicion test if you're not doing drugs it's going to vindicate you and it's not an accusation it's really when i do supervisor training i explain to them it's a fact-finding mission when we see the signs and symptoms or get these reports that would trigger it they're just ruling it out and proving that drugs were not the cause of this so don't take it as a personal affront it's not so reasonable suspicion testing, again, it requires that the supervisor fill out a report. Queen Anne's County requires that they fill out a report even if it's a non-DOT. So when we do do reasonable suspicion testing, oftentimes we will do expanded panel. The, on the right-hand side or the left-hand side of the screen, you see the nine to five, that's marijuana, the opiates, which are codeine, morphine, six ma'am, and then the four semi-synthetics hydrocodone, hydromorphone, oxycodone, oxymorphone. Then we also test for amphetamines, that's amphetamine, methamphetamine, ecstasy, cocaine, and PCP. But in a reasonable suspicion or expanded panel, even post-accident test, we test for more drugs. We're going to test for benzos, which would include Valium, Xanax, Ativan. We're going to test for barbiturates, that's going to include secondol, tuanol, nembutol, uh, buprenorphine or suboxone. We're going to test for fentanyl. Um, and possibly some other car fentanyl designer drugs, any drugs that may be abused, we're going to test for in a reasonable suspicion based on the behaviors or the reports that we may have. So again, do not forget, Maryland has a zero tolerance policy with regards to a positive DOT drug or alcohol test. You are decertified for a period of no less than 10 years. Okay, so a refusal to test. These are the things, any of these refusal to test, if you have a refusal to test, that is going to cause you to be decertified. Failure to appear for a test at any time, failure to remain at the testing site, um, failure to allow observation or monitoring when that's required, 
failure to provide a sufficient sample without an explanation. If you go and you have a shy bladder or a shy lung, we have to send you for a medical evaluation. The medical evaluation will determine whether or not it is legitimately um, a medically legitimate explanation for why you didn't provide. If you didn't, the MR is going to call it a refusal. If the employer tells you you have to take a second test and you refuse to go over, a good example of that would be the post-accident. You took the non-DOT and then the ticket came and they said you got to go back over and you're like, I already took my test. You were told to take a second test. Even if you think it's wrong, go take the test. Not going to take the test is going to be a refusal, and that's going to get you decertified for 10 years. Also, if you get caught with a device clearly intended to pass or beat a drug test, you know, your whizinator comes from sticking out of your pants or you drop your, you know, high hand, that's going to get you uh, refusal to test. If you admit to the collector or to the MRO that you substituted or adulterated your sample, that's going to be considered a refusal to test, positive. Um, if the MRO reports it is adulterated or substituted. For alcohol testing, if you refuse to sign the form, that's a refusal. Any employee who is subject to post-accident testing who fails to remain readily available, that is a refusal to test. Now, just so you know, if ever you were in an accident and you need medical treatment, Okay, medical treatment always supersedes the drug or alcohol test. Medical treatment comes first, but you need to advise the supervisor, you need to advise Queen Anne's County where you are and what's going on. You can't just say, oh, well, I hurt my neck, so I went to the hospital. That's not the way it works. You need to notify them immediately, and then we will take it from there. If you have to go get medical treatment, we'll work around the medical treatment, but you don't just go and not let somebody know where you are. You have to make sure, and again, remaining readily available for that 32, full 32 hour period. If you fail to do so, you could be deemed a refusal to test and decertify for 10 years. If, again, you can't give a good sample and we finish out the three hours and we send you, we make an appointment for a medical evaluation and you don't show up for that evaluation, that's automatically a refusal. Um, failure to cooperate with the testing process, you refuse to empty your pockets, you refuse to wash your hands, you become disruptive. The collector can say, this is a refusal to test, so you need to be cooperative with the collection process. For a direct observation, now direct observation only happens if we get an invalid sample or if you come out and you give me a sample, you set it down, it's cold, it's blue, it's busy, I'm going to make you have a second sample collected under direct observation, meaning a same sex observer is going to go in the stall with you. You got to raise the clothing up above the uh, navel, turn around. You got to pull the pants down above the below, just above the knee so we can see you don't have nothing tape top hidden. Turn around. We got to make sure there's nothing. And then the collector watches you go from body to bottle. If you refuse to do any portions of that, that is a refusal to test. Direct observation, again, only happens when there's a suspicious sample. Doesn't just happen. You're not going to get a direct observation. So other prohibited behaviors that you need to know about. It is illegal and considered grounds for immediate termination to manufacture, distribute, dispense, possess uh, illegal drugs or drug paraphernalia on Queen Anne's County premises. That would include on buses, and in parking lots of contractors, that's all considered property, even though it's a private contractor. It's for this purpose, it's part of the county uh, for this purpose, for this policy. You can't be under the influence of illegal drugs while on the job um, or alcohol. You can't use it or have it on the premises, so you can't keep a bottle of schnapps tucked under your bus seat. Um, you can't possess or consume alcohol while on duty, obviously. But some other prohibited behaviors that we have. Um, off the job, illegal use or activity which results in a criminal conviction. If you get a criminal conviction for drug or alcohol under Marilyn Comar, you're done. They can't let you drive. Um, any violation of prohibited behaviors could be grounds for immediate termination, um, illegal substances. If somebody finds something on your bus 
They are going to turn it over to the police. So obviously these are common sense things, and as bus drivers, you guys are going to know. Now I know sometimes you know kids bring things on your bus, so of course if you find anything, you would immediately notify the supervisor, notify your contractor, notify the board, and you need to call the police and have that substance removed. Because if you try to dispose of it or discard it yourself, you could get blamed for being the owner. So don't ever take that into your own hands immediately. And thank God you, know, you guys know there's cameras on the bus. So again, zero tolerance, decertify for 10 years, don't make a mistake. We don't want to see that happen. So um, another consequence of a positive test. Starting January 6th of 2020, the Federal Motor Carrier came out with a thing that's called the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration Drug and Alcohol Clearinghouse. Okay, the clearinghouse is a database. It's a national database that all employers have to access. Any positive, verified positive drug test result, any confirmed alcohol test result greater than 0.04 will be, and any refusal of the test, will be entered on the clearinghouse. The medical review officer is going to enter on the drug test. The employer is going to enter on the alcohol test, the refusals are entered by both depending on what kind of refusal it was. So the Federal Motor Carry Clearinghouse is a national database. It's used by employers, it's used by medical review officers, it's used by third party administrators. That's what I am, white glove. We you know manage your policy. We help, we enter things for the county. Um, it's used by substance abuse professionals and also drivers. Any driver, if you're a new driver, you have to register for the clearinghouse because as of January 6, 2020, any new driver has to register for the clearinghouse. If you're already a driver for Queen Anne's County, you didn't have to register. New drivers would have to register. But a driver can register at any time. Okay. So what happens is the um, employers are required to perform what's called queries. So a full query, this is a pre-employment, any pre-employment, they must do what's called a full query on the clearinghouse. And the reason that the drivers have to register is because in order to do a full query, you have to get electronic consent through the clearinghouse. So the way it works is you as a driver, you register on the clearinghouse as a driver. When you come for your job with Queen Anne's County Public Schools, Margaret Ellen or someone at the transportation department will take your uh, information, your driver's license name, your name, your date of birth, your driver's license number, the state, and they'll go onto the clearinghouse and they'll run a query. The clearinghouse will then send you an email that says, Queen Anne's County Public Schools is trying to do a query on you. Do you consent? You have to physically go on there and say, yes, I consent. Once you do, the information comes back to tell them that there were no records found on the clearinghouse. No records meaning no drug or alcohol violations. If it comes back and it says records were found, it's also going to tell them, because it's a full query, exactly what records were found. You had a positive, you used to work for Coca-Cola, and you had a positive for marijuana back in March of 2020 on a random test. All that information is going to show up. So they are required to do that for all new hires effective January 6, 2020. Also, once a year, at least once a year, they can do it more so, but at least once a year, they have to do a what's called a limited query on all the current drivers. So once a year, they have to take every driver and they have to run their name through the database. If anything shows up, it's just, it's a limited query, so it's not gonna give the full details, but it'll come back and it'll say records exist. If that's the case, then you're going to get called in the office and they're going to say, we got records exist, you need to register so we can then now do a full query to find out exactly what these records are. Anything that's on the database, you as a driver, if you register, are entitled to see it. And there's also ways that you can dispute anything that is on the clearinghouse. Nothing is going to get reported that you don't know about. It's not like somebody can go behind your back and put something on there. Everything that goes on, you're notified about it. You're notified through the clearinghouse. You're notified through the mail. Um, they will notify you. The clearinghouse is done through the state driver's license administration. So when you get your driver's license, the driver's license number is the first thing it goes through. So And all drug testing is done, drug and alcohol testing is done using the driver's license number. So there's no errors in the number got entered wrong. If you go on there to do a query or to enter a result on a person, 
The first thing you have to do is put the driver's license number, name, and date of birth. If all those things don't match with the state driver's license administration, nothing gets posted until the federal motor carrier can figure out what's going on. So um, the limited queries do require you to sign a paper consent form that the, the board has to keep for the duration of your employment and then at least three years after the last query. So you do have to sign a paper consent for the once a year. You only have to sign that one time, though. It doesn't matter what contract you work for. It's good for the entire time you're driving for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. So um, if you are going to get a job and you say, I'm not going to register for this clearinghouse, you're not eligible to perform safety-sensitive functions until they get this query back. So if you refuse to register, you're not eligible to drive. And that's not just for Queen Anne's County. That's anywhere that requires a CDL license or any um, safety-sensitive functions under federal motor carrier. You cannot perform safety-sensitive functions for a federal motor carrier unless you consent to the query. Um, limited queries that return information. So uh, if they do the once a year query and it comes back and says there's records, they then have to call you in, like I said, and say you need to register for the clearinghouse so we can run a full query. If you refuse to register and you refuse to do that after 24 hours, they have to remove you from duty. You're no longer eligible to drive and you will not be permitted to drive until that consent form is, is done that electronic consent if you refuse to sign the paper consent you're no longer eligible to drive so um the reason that this is so important by the, the thing went live in january by the end of february more than eight thousand positive results have been reported to the clearinghouse so it is required nobody has a choice in this it's to keep the highways and byways safe and again Going back to the nature of what you guys do, this is just a no-brainer. It's mandatory. Nobody wants to put their children on a school bus that they don't feel like the driver is safe. And this is one of the ways that we ensure safety behind the wheel. So um, Queen Anne's County also requires that anybody driving a school bus gets their medications clear with their physician before they start using them. Do not take any prescription drugs. Now, when I say any prescription drugs, I'm not talking about a cholesterol medicine. I'm talking about anything that is a narcotic, have it for me, anything that's got that warning label, do not drive or operate heavy equipment, anything that's got that big sleepy eye on it may cause drowsiness. You should not be taking that without having that clear by your physician. The Board of Education has forms that you can take with you to your doctor that allows your doctor to, it identifies that you're a school bus driver, it allows the doctor to understand that you are a commercial driver and, you know, that you have a commercial driver's license and they can then make a decision. We don't want to impede anybody's medical treatment, but we also don't want people using impaired prescription drugs behind the wheel. Just because you legally got it out of your medicine cabinet doesn't mean it's any less safe and it doesn't cause impairment. So we have to all be diligent on that. Now, again, the OT employees are required to inform a physician before they get any medication that they're a commercial driver's license, they have a commercial driver's license, and that they perform safety sensitive functions. Again, the form I spoke about is the 391.41 driver medication form. It's a real nice form. You take it to your doctor. It has a definition of a commercial motor vehicle operator, a commercial driver's license, your duties, what you need to do, how you need to be you know, of the right mind and judgment and physically you need to be able to react in impairing substances and it allows your doctor to list that they don't feel like this is going to pose a threat, okay? So it's, it's required that you do this. So another reason that you need to do this is because let's just say you have a prescription. So the MRO has to report it as negative. The MRO is also bound under DOT regs to report what's called a safety concern. So here's what happens. You test positive at the laboratory, let's just say for codeine. You test positive at the laboratory for codeine. The MRO interviews you and finds out that you have a back problem and you're taking codeine as part of your back problem, you take codeine. So you give the MRO the prescription, it's legitimate, they verify it. The MRO is gonna report that as negative to Queen Anne's County, but they're gonna to say to you, 
I need to speak to your prescribing physician in five days because I got concerns about you taking codeine and operating a bus. I need to make sure your doctor understands that you're a school bus driver and they're okay with you operating a bus taking codeine. So have your doctor call me. If your doctor doesn't call them within five business days, the MRO is going to issue what's called a safety letter. The safety letter comes and says, although the driver tested negative, I have a safety concern regarding the use of a medication. They're not going to say what because they're not allowed to. They're just going to say they have a safety concern and they recommend a, quote, fitness for duty evaluation of the driver. So what's going to happen? Well, once the board gets the safety letter, they are going to require you to go back to the person that did your DOT physical with a copy of the safety letter and the letter from me explaining everything that's going on. And if you reported it on your DOT physical, you're going to be fine because the person who did the DOT physical has already said, yeah, I understand they're taking care of it and I talked to their doctor, I'm good with it, end of story. If it wasn't reported on the DOT physical, now you're going to have a problem because now you're going to have to go back to the person who did your DOT physical and explain to them why you didn't tell them that you're taking this narcotic. And you could very well be disqualified. In fact, more than not, people are disqualified for not disclosing that information. This is a serious safety issue, so not reporting these medications on a DOT physical is not advisable, and eventually it is going to come out on the drug test, and there's a good chance that you're going to be disqualified. So make sure you're upfront about it. Make sure your physician knows. Make sure the DOT medical examiner knows. Everybody knows exactly what medications you're taking. I don't care if you've been taking it for 20 years and you feel it's safe, you can't medically clear yourself. Only the medical examiner can do that. So you need to make sure that you're up on front and on board with everybody being completely honest about medications that you're taking. So you're not allowed, again, to perform safety-sensitive duties unless you've had the medication cleared. I just want to make that clear that everybody needs to report these medications and make sure these medications are cleared. If it comes out, and it might come out on a post-accident non-DOT test, but it's going to come out that you're using these medications. So make sure everybody is honest about these medications. So another policy consideration is obviously medical marijuana. Well, marijuana is still a Schedule I drug on a federal level, so there is no medical marijuana for our intents and purposes. It doesn't matter what the state of Maryland may or may not say from the, from the federal government, from the Drug Enforcement Administration, it is a Schedule I drug. Schedule I means you're not allowed to possess it, manufacture it, dispense it, use it. They don't even want you looking at it. The DOT has published countless notices, one regarding medical marijuana. If you test positive, you will be terminated and you will be decertified for 10 years. So you need to make sure you recognize that. Okay, again, the DOT published several notices. Now, along with that, in fact, the DOT went further as when they rewrote the regulations in 2018, they redefined the term prescription so nobody could claim they had a prescription. No doctor in any of the 50 states can write a prescription for you to have marijuana. They can make a recommendation, and that's what they do. They make recommendations that you use, but they will never write a prescription. So the DOT went ahead to redefine or to drill down on the definition of prescription to explain it has to be a written correspondence because no doctor in, in, the, in any of the 50 states can legally write you a prescription for a Schedule One drug. The minute they put their name on a prescription pad with a Schedule One drug, they've invalidated their DEA and their DEA is revoked. So no doctor can write a prescription, so it's verboten. Um, again, marijuana is a Schedule One drug, along with PCP and heroin and ecstasy. It is illegal in all 50 states, regardless of what the states say. And it is all about safety. People can argue all day with me about the efficacy of medical marijuana. It's about safety. These are the phrases that marijuana smokers use themselves to describe. Stone, high, wasted, baked. Dazed, fried, cooked, toasted, burnt, bent, couch locked, useless, wrecked. I would not want any of these to apply to a school bus driver. 
So uh, the medical part is not applicable in this particular instance. Um, one of the other things that you also um, need to consider is hemp products, okay? Hemp products would be these edibles and these oils and CBD, which I'm going to talk about. They will cause a positive drug test if they have THC in them, and they all do, many of these edibles, and many of these hemp products that are sold now under the guise of, you know, hemp products contain THC. If there's THC in it and you test positive, the medical review officer cannot accept that. It's the same THC that's in marijuana that gets you high. So if you test positive and you use one of these products, you will be decertified for 10 years. So CBD oil, despite the fact that they've been decriminalized in 47 states, they are still Schedule One drug. There is no legal CBD oil. What you have to understand about CBD oil is there is nobody regulating or overseeing CBD oils, okay? CBD oils, anybody can just go out on Amazon, get some fancy bottles, get a label maker. You can put anything and everything in a bottle, label it CBD, and sell it, and nobody's going to come after you at this point in time. The things that have been confiscated, the Drug Enforcement Administration on their website routinely publish what they found when they confiscate these quote-unquote CBD oils. They found these CBD oils to contain arsenic, lead, salmonella, fentanyl, and a host of other things in there that most of them, more than 50% of them, don't contain any CBD at all. They're, they're, they found them to be motor oil, um, cooking oil, any kind of thing, food coloring, water with food coloring. Um, there's a picture of these pills here, and uh, the DEA back in January confiscated at one of the ports of entry um, the, the drug cartels. Because, see, the drug cartels have realized now that this is a way to further their enterprise because Ozzy and Harriet Nelson use CBD oil. So they're now selling things that they're claiming to be CBD oils that are not at all CBD. At the border in January, the DEA confiscated a huge tra tractor trailer full. And what it turned out, it was just like those, and it was labeled CBD. And you know what it turned out to be? It was dog flea medicine that had expired, and all they did was repackaged it as CBD. So it was actually dog flea tablets that people were going to take as a CBD product. So again, it's like Russian roulette out there. Don't use it. Don't try it, because if you test positive, you're decertified for 10 years. There's one exception, and that's a, a drug that's called Epidiolex. Epidiolex is the only FDA-approved. Epidiolex was developed. It is manufactured by a legitimate pharmaceutical provider. You do need a prescription. It is a scheduled drug that a doctor can write a prescription for that you take to a Walgreens or a Rite Aid or whatever to get filled. It's prescribed for seizure disorders in children. There are some physicians that are you writing it what we call off-label, meaning um, you know they're writing it for other aspects. So epidiolex is the only one. Now with the concentration of THC that's in epidiolex, you should not test positive. But if you somehow got epidiolex, and I guess you were consuming large amounts of it, in theory you would be over the cutoff level. Um, if you produce the prescription, the MR will verify negative, but then you're going to run into a safety concern because if you're consuming so much epidiolex that you're testing positive over the cutoff level, there's going to be an issue anyway. Passive inhalation. So this is what people always use for an excuse. You know, I wasn't smoking, my roommate smoked, or I was around people smoking. Remember I told you, HHS routinely reevaluates the cutoff levels. They do studies right down here in Rockville, Maryland, where they bring people in, they put them in a phone booth-sized uh, booth, it's hermetically sealed, and they put goggles on them and blow medical-grade marijuana smoke on them all day, and then they drug test them. And based on the results of those studies, NIDA has set the cutoff level. So you can ride back and forth to BWI Airport with Bob Marley in the car. As long as you don't smoke it, you're not going to test positive. So when people say that they were around people smoking it, that's not true. Somehow you've ingested marijuana. Now, what I've seen more and more is they are around people that smoke marijuana, and they'll say, I swear I didn't smoke. Maybe you ate something. Again, think about the edibles. So you need to think about that because I'll say to them, have you eaten anything at their house? Possibly you ate some edibles. 
and you can see by the look on their face, they realize that's probably how they got it. It doesn't matter. THC in your system is THC in your system, and whether it was an accidental or purposeful ingestion is irrelevant. All we care about is what the result is, and you will be decertified over this. And I can actually think of two or three bus drivers that have been decertified, one over CBD oil, one over unknown consumption of edible, and the other one was actual purposeful ingestion of edibles. They didn't realize that that was illegal. So don't let yourself fall into that trap. So let me talk about opioids for a second here. NIDA estimates that one in four people are illegally abusing prescriptions, their prescription drugs. Um, most of these people become addicted from a physician prescribes it, and then they just start using it. We are a pill-popping nation. Up until 2014, that was the last year. In 2014, the DEA reclassified hydrocodone or Vicodin from a Schedule Three to a Schedule Two. What does that mean? Well, a Schedule Three drug means that the doctor can just call it in. You don't have to have the written prescription. They can call in refills. They can write it for large amounts. Once it went to a Schedule II, a Schedule II drug, you physically have to take the paper copy to the pharmacy. It can only be written for no more than one month. It can't have refills. You have to have exact directions. It can't be called in. Because the Schedule II paper copy, the pharmacy sends a, either the original or a facsimile to the drug diversion office in Atlanta. Every doctor in the country that has a DEA number has a file in Atlanta in the drug diversion office. And uh, all Schedule II prescriptions are put in that file. So once doctors realized that these paper copies were going in their files, the numbers of prescriptions written for Vicodin between 2014 and 2015 dropped by 73%. But up until that point, hydrocodone was the number one prescribed drug in the United States. More than simvastatin, that would be your cholesterol medicine. More than lisinopril, that would be your blood pressure medicine. Believe it or not, more than Viagra. Number one drug in the United States until it was reclassified. We have 5% of the world's population, and we consume 99% of the hydrocodone in, in the world. We consume 85% of the oxycodone in the world. 80% of new heroin users started by becoming addicted to prescription drugs, and they were no longer able to acquire the amount of prescription drugs required to sustain their habit. So fentanyl is another big problem. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. It's 80 to 100 times more powerful than morphine. Um, fentanyl is being added to cocaine. It's being added to heroin to cut it. It's being added to CBD oil to give people a high. Um, it's very, very dangerous. The people that are using this fentanyl to cut their drugs and to add, they're even adding it sometimes to marijuana. The people that are using this, they're not chemists, they're not pharmacists, and oftentimes when you hear of all these overdoses, it surrounds fentanyl because that is a lethal dose of fentanyl. It does not take much fentanyl to kill you. So if you don't know what you're doing and you're just adding fentanyl to a product, that's a lethal dose. Uh -oh. It doesn't take much. So then we have car fentanyl. Let's kick it up a notch. This is 10,000 times more potent than morphine and 100 times more potent than fentanyl. Car fentanyl is so dangerous. This is the one law enforcement is petrified because you can just be in the same room with car fentanyl and breathe it in and overdose it. They can give people multiple doses of Narcan and you will not be revived. Narcan doesn't work on people who have overdosed on car fentanyl. That is a lethal dose of car fentanyl. So just to put it in perspective, that's pure heroin, that's fentanyl, and that's car fentanyl. And you can see the lethal doses, it does not take but a grain of car fentanyl to kill you. So every day, more than 130 people die in the United States from opioid overdoses. We all know the opioid problem has been you know, out of control for many years, and it's been continuing to escalate. It's causing a big economic drain on society. Each month, more Americans die from opioid overdoses than those that died in 9-11. Between 1999 and 2017, 
more Americans died from opioid overdoses than the Americans who died in World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Persian Gulf War, and the World War on Terror combined. We lost more people to opioids in that period of time, that less than 20 year period, that 18 year, 17 year period, 18 year period, we lost more Americans than all those wars combined. So White Glove staff is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, anytime you guys got any questions, problems, it's not my program, it's not Queen Anne's County's program, it's our program, we're all involved in it together, and I, am, I would encourage you, anytime you have a question or concern, to not hesitate to call, we're more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, be safe behind the wheel, and just, you guys are doing the Lord's work and keep doing what you're doing. <laughs>